We now take you to the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco for oral arguments in the case of Bates versus Jones. That case considers the constitutionality of the California voter passed Proposition 140, which places term limits on California's state legislators. While we're waiting for the process to begin, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit is the largest of the 13 circuits of the U.S. Court of Appeals. It has 28 judgeships, and the judges are appointed by the President with the advice and consent of the U.S. Senate. Their appointment to the federal bench is one for life, and there are currently 10 judgeship vacancies on this court. Council, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we've had three, this is our third in bank today, and each of the other two in banks, I have mentioned that uh, uh, we uh, would like to dedicate this day to one of our colleagues, Judge Cecil Poole, who died this last week. Uh, We will, uh, at a later date, uh, have a uh, formal memorial service in his honor. But I'd like to take this occasion to uh, pay our respects to this distinguished colleague of ours. He was a skilled United States attorney in the 1960s and was selected by Time Magazine as the man of the year. He later became a distinguished district judge and thereafter a well-respected member of our court. He served with wisdom, integrity, and compassion, and we'll all remember his delightful sense of humor. We will miss him a great deal. Now I'd like to uh, turn to the matter of the day. That's Jones, uh, Bates versus Jones, and we'll hear from the <coughs> appellant. May it please the court, my name is Einar Elhake, and I will be representing the Secretary of State, Bill Jones, in this matter. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Your Honors, among the truths that this nation has held self-evident since the Declaration of Independence is that it is the right of the people to institute government for their own ends and that it is, quote, the right of the people to alter it, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. In their constitution, the people of California claim precisely the same right of self-government that led to the creation of our United States. And here, they have chosen to exercise that right of self-government in a relatively modest fashion to limit the terms of their state legislature. This case is about whether the U.S. Constitution, which chose to limit the terms of the U.S. President, somehow denies the same choice to the people when organizing their state legislatures. There is no text in the U.S. Constitution that would compel such an odd conclusion. Nor is this the kind of case where the courts are justified 
in relying on relatively general principles of constitutional law to protect groups underrepresented by the political process. In fact, since the enactment of term limits, the number of women and minority legislators has increased. The number of women legislators has increased by 25%. The number of Hispanic legislators has increased by 20, 250%. And the number of Asian legislators has gone from zero to two. It's also not the kind of case where the court is justified in drawing on the normal rationale for the Supreme Court's voting rights doctrine. That is, it's not the kind of case where the court needs to police efforts by incumbents to manipulate the voting process to entrench themselves. That is the ordinary warrant for thinking that judges could do better than a political process, and it's not present here. Indeed, precisely the opposite. Term limits are all about ending the entrenchment of incumbents. And it would be perverse to use a doctrine that was designed to prevent incumbents from entrenching themselves, instead as an aid to prevent the people from ending their entrenchment. So I don't think it's very surprising that every other court to consider the issue outside this circuit has concluded that term limits on state officials do not violate the US Constitution. The Supreme Court in Moore did not even think that this issue raised a substantial federal question. And 10 other cases agree. I think this alone warrants reversal. Precedent would mean little and can afford little guidance if even after 10 prior cases on the same topic, each subsequent court feels obliged to reconsider the matter afresh by applying general principles. How many of those 10 are U.S. Circuit Court? <coughs> U.S. Circuit Courts, there are two U.S. Circuit Court opinions. But uh, state Supreme Court opinions are equally uh, valid on questions of federal constitutional law. And there is a conflict uh, with uh, three of those, as well as a conflict with the U.S. Supreme Court opinion, which is, of course, authoritatively binding on this court. What is the status of the Supreme Court of California decision on this case? You say authoritatively binding with respect to the Supreme Court of the United States, but what about the legislature versus you case, which apparently resolved this very issue, did it not? Yes, it did resolve this very issue. Uh, we think that that opinion is binding as to all parties to legislature versus you, as any legislator who was a party to that case, and that that should include legislators who donated money and were represented uh, by the litigants in that case. It should be authoritatively binding as to them. But is that the same as res judicata? Uh, yes, because it's the same claim being raised again. Well, I've got a little bit of a problem with that. I, I respect the <coughs> Supreme Court of California decision on the merits, but I'm not entirely persuaded that there is complete privity in this situation? What's, what's your view? I think there is privity, and that it's sufficient uh, that the litigants donated uh, money, half of the uh, funds for the litigation in, litiga in legislature versus you came from donations raised by non-named party legislators, among them the named plaintiff here, Tom uh, Bates. Uh, they were represented in the sense that the legislators there were seeking the same things uh, as were sought here. They claimed it violated the First and Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, and in fact, they delivered uh, in that litigation uh, pension benefits uh, for those legislators. So uh, they are in privity, I think, in the same sense uh, there was privity in the Reinsberg uh, case, California Supreme Court, court case. Now, it's true uh, that the court below found uh, that the litigants here were not in control of the prior case. But that's a different branch of race judicata under California uh, law. There's one branch that says you're bound if you were in control of the case, another branch that says you're bound if you uh, were in the, the actual parties were in a representative capacity uh, with you. Mr. Uh, L. Hay, in you, the California Supreme Court 
said the voters were sufficiently notified or uh, informed as to the uh, effect of Proposition 140. And as I take it, in California, voter intent is a legitimate subject of inquiry on an initiative. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is correct. For so California has looked into that <coughs> voter intent. Now, to what extent does the federal government, through its courts, have the power to look into voter intent and whether the state voters were adequately informed or not, independent of recent case? Thank you. Well, I think in terms of the construction of the statute, uh, this court is authoritatively bound by the California Supreme Court. I know, case. you've argued that, but yes. that's the res judicata argument, I think. But also the construction of the statute, whether the statute imposes uh, a life, lifetime term limits or consecutive terms. It's a state statute, and the state court has interpreted it, and we should be bound by the state court's interpretation? Right. Uh, okay. Suppose if we don't agree to that and think, or, or rather, suppose we go along with that. And the next question is, having interpreted the statute as ambiguous as California did, isn't the next question whether then the voters were sufficiently apprised of the effect of the measure? Well, I take it you're referring to the due process uh, claim. No, my question process. is whether the federal court should look into that at all or whether that's a matter only if the state looks into. Well, I think if there was uh, a due process claim, it would be a matter for the federal courts to look into. But of course, one of the doctrines in due process law is that the state courts can provide all the process that is due. And as long as the state courts have a full and fair process for determining the intent of the voter and whether the measure was understood uh, by the voters, that should provide all the process that is necessary. And I think it's actually a preferable process because the California courts have an expedited process for resolving these questions before the initiatives are voted <coughs> on, rather than waiting until seven years after the fact. Council, I, I uh, got something from the colloquy you just had with Judge Thompson that may be a little different from your focus. Uh, as I understand it, it's state law that an initiative has to either be clear or there needs to be evidence that the voters were adequately informed. Uh, it's, not so, it's not so plain that there is any federal constitutional requirement that there can't be initiatives unless those desirable things are in existence. Uh, yes, that's you, res right. you responded on a slightly different subject due process. The words due process are not in a vacuum in the Constitution. It says life, liberty, or property can't be taken without due process. Obviously, the initiative doesn't take uh, life or property, and I can't figure out what protected liberty, what liberty protected under the Constitution is at issue here. Well, there are some cases in other courts that have held there could be a substantive due process violation if the ballot materials are so misleading uh, that the voter doesn't know, doesn't know which initiative they're voting on. We're, but we're expanding substantive due process from abortion and things of that nature to uh, ballot initiatives now? Yes, but only when <coughs> they uh, go far beyond garden variety problems and as this court has held and, and uh, go to the very organic process uh, of government. But those courts have all agreed that access to the text, however ambiguous that text may be, cures any problem. The only problem is when the government steps in and through the ballot uh, encourages voters to vote for, say, Proposition 100, uh, when instead they thought they were going for Proposition 140. It has to be that they don't even know what the proposition is. Not that the proposition may have ambiguous effects. The voters uh, have a right to vote for ambiguous measures if they choose. <coughs> uh, so that even if this measure was ambiguous, uh, there would be no due process problem. But I really don't think there was any ambiguity uh, in the measure in any event. Uh, Judge Thompson referred uh, to the California Supreme Court's acknowledgement of an ambiguity. 
But there they were talking about ambiguity uh, for the purposes of invoking the doctrine whether the statute should be narrowly construed to avoid constitutional invalidation. They weren't saying it was ambiguous in the sense that the average voter wouldn't have understood what the measure said. Didn't you argue ambiguity before California Supreme Court, or am I wrong in that? Uh, I certainly uh, did not. You uh, did. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Attorney General, on behalf of the former uh, Secretary of State, did say that the measure was facially uh, ambiguous. Uh, but again, that was in the context of invoking the doctrine uh, of narrowly construing it to avoid constitutional invalidation. Uh, not to say that the voters did not understand the measure. That argument had not been made either in legislature versus you or in the complaint in this case for a trial. So I think the, the measure on its face says no senator shall serve more than two terms. No assembly member shall serve more than three terms. Uh, the purported ambiguity is that, well, once you leave office, you're no longer a senator and no longer covered, and thus you could run for re-election. But once you, if you did run, this measure doesn't say no senator may run for re-election after serving more than three terms, but no senator may serve more than two terms. So once you were re-elected, you would once again be a senator and you'd be serving more than two terms. In any event, there was the surrounding ballot materials, uh, repeated references to the measure imposing the <coughs> lifetime ban that are quoted uh, in the brief. Uh, the, the proponents and the legislative anal analyst emphasized that it limited uh, the number of terms, which consecutive term limits do not do. After a hiatus, you're able with consecutive term limits to serve an unlimited uh, number of terms. So I think both on his face, but certainly reinforced by the ballot materials, <coughs> it was clear what the voters were voting on uh, and uh, that the California Supreme Court uh, so ruled in legislature uh, versus you. Now, if, the, if this court were uh, to apply the standard fresh as the verdict test of uh, afresh, it's important to recognize uh, that Gregory and Taylor and the like require this court pay substantial deference uh, to the state legislative choice to impose qualifications on its state officers. So although the uh, verdict discriminatory and unreasonable test applies, the court should find that that is met here only if it was plainly and obviously met not if it's at all close question uh, in this case. And that is to recognize, that Supreme Court doctrine recognizes the importance of the right of self-government and that that right of self-government should only be taken away when the Constitution of the United States quite plainly demands uh, that result. I'm reserving the rest of my time uh, for rebuttal. All right, thank you, Council. <coughs> May it please the court, I'm Deborah Lefetra, representing the sponsors of California's term limits law. Your Honors, the Anderson balancing test comes down to two things. On one side, there's the severity of the burden, and on the other side is the state interest. As far as the severity of the burden, Anderson and Clements teach that courts must look at it in a realistic light. And so here is the reality of the burden of term limits. In Tom Bates District, there are 370,000 people. One may reasonably estimate that 100,000 of them are disqualified from running for the state legislature. They're disqualified because they are felons, because they are underage, because they're not citizens, or because they've only recently moved to the district. After term limits, the number of people disqualified in Tom Bates District is 100,001. And over the course of 50 years, there will be a maximum of eight individuals who will be disqualified by term limits in that district for the assembly. In Martha Scucci's district, the 50th assembly district, there's no burden whatsoever. If, if the burden in Tom Bates was infinitesimal, the difference between 100,000 and 100,001, 
There is no burden to Martha Scucci's district because she's disqualified in any event. She moved her house outside of the district. So those three voters who testified that they want more than anything in the world to vote for Martha Scucci in 1998 cannot do it. And they cannot do it because she is disqualified under the residence requirement and because she is disqualified under term limits. Does that affect standing in this case? Uh, Your Honor, I believe it does for those uh, voters of the 50th because their, their sole cause of action is that they cannot vote for Martha Scuccia due to term limits. And because Martha Scuccia is disqualified one way or the other, where's their cause of action? Did the trial judge make any finding on the standing issue as to this particular point? Um, I, I do not I don't believe that, that she made a specific finding on that point. Well, was the evidence before her and was the issue tender? The, uh, the evidence was before her, the testimony of Martha Scuccia on cross-examination. Um, also, your honors, the voters in this case did not have their votes diluted or debased in any way. Every one of those voters went to the polls, they cast their votes, their votes were counted. They, they cast their votes on an equal basis with everyone else in the jurisdiction. They all testified that the, the voters who were residents of the 14th Assembly District testified that they were going to vote for Dion Ariner in the general election. They presumably did go vote for Dion Ariner, and she's now sitting in the state legislature. That is not a severe burden on the right to vote. So given that the right to vote in this case, the, the burden on it is, is barely cognizable, then we turn to the state's interest. And the state's interest in this case has been described by Judge Reimer as super compelling because this is the right of a state to determine the qualifications of its own officers. And in Gregory v. Ashcroft, the Supreme Court spent quite a bit of time talking about the, the textual basis for this in the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment and Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution guarantees to the states the right to do this. Could, a, fact, could a state uh, bar lawyers? From uh, holding public office? Well, certainly this circuit has upheld uh, the right of states to require that candidates for judicial office be attorneys. That was not my question, counsel. Could the voters of California or the California legislature enact legislation that would bar lawyers from holding public office, statewide public office in the state of California? I think, Your Honor, that it would have to be addressed under the rational basis test. Lawyers are... <laughs> Some of us might regret not a protected class. <laughs> and the, the, the state interests are just as compelling there. So is your answer yes or no? I think it would have to, uh, to depend on, on the state. I, I don't think that excluding all lawyers would pass even the rational basis test. But I maintain that the rational basis test would be the appropriate standard of review. So your answer is no? I, don't be I, I believe that, that that would not survive even rational basis review. What about a, a prohibition against uh, people who graduate from law schools outside of the Ninth Circuit? Your Honor, that too is it's a hypothetical, but it really doesn't get to the, the issues in this case. Because what this case is about is about incumbents mm -hmm who had proven themselves to be, in the words of the California Supreme Court, an entrenched dynastic bureaucracy who could not be unseated. There was no competition. There was no way to, to get them out of office short of the term limits that the people eventually enacted. Some people feel that way about lawyers. I think that it is easy to see a rational basis, even, even a compelling reason for limiting the terms of incumbents. And in a sense, this goes back to, to Judge O'Scanlan's question as to what weight do we give the California Supreme Court decision. Setting aside the res judicata issue, under the Rodriguez case, the US Supreme Court said that the state Supreme Court's uh, assessment of the justification and need for election regulations <coughs> is entitled to deference. And here, the California Supreme Court expressly held that the reasons for enacting term limits were not only legitimate, but also compelling because of the incumbency advantages, because of the edge that they had in terms of raising money. Uh, there, there, there's a whole list of reasons. 
but also go to the policy of term limits. And the district court held that uh, there was a less invasive way of accomplishing that objective. What would you say to that? Your Honor, the, the most common so-called less restrictive way is consecutive term limits. But in reality, consecutive term limits and the lifetime limit are the same thing. It's just a matter of drawing the line. Because if you have a certain window in between the terms served, you serve three terms and you have to take a time off, well, if you take two years off, if you take 10 years off, if you take 30 years off, this is very clearly political line drawing. And the people of California decided that the line has to be way out there if we're going to achieve the goals that we want to accomplish. Whether the people had decided there would be a 30-year gap between terms served or a lifetime limit doesn't make any difference. Does the provision have to be narrowly tailored to serve the interests, or does Burdick versus Takushi establish that it does not have to be uh, narrowly tailored? Judge Kleinfeld, it does not have to be narrowly tailored because, as I said at the outset, this goes back to the burden. If there's no severe burden, there's no strict scrutiny, no strict scrutiny, no narrow tailoring. And so because there's no severe burden on the right to vote, this goes to the rational basis end of the Anderson v. Celebrese uh, spectrum. And under rational basis, certainly we do not look to narrow tailoring. And all suppose, suppose that uh, we disagreed with you and that, in fact, uh, strict scrutiny is required. What would be your, your response as to whether the, the uh, narrow uh, tailoring of the remedy would be something less? Even under strict <coughs> scrutiny, California's term limits pass constitutional muster. The lifetime limit is necessary to prevent the revolving door syndrome. It's required to prevent place holding. It's required to give those incumbents the time frame of, well, we better get our act together and get our, our work done now because we're going to be out of here soon. It's required for all of these reasons, which are policy judgments, Your Honor. These are policy judgments that the people of California made for the structure of their own legislature. And they decide that these things are really important and they are entitled to make that uh, determination. And so whether it's decided under rational basis, which is appropriate, or even under strict scrutiny, California's term limits are constitutional. All right, thank you, Council. Chief Judge Hogg and members of the court, I'm Joseph Remcho for the plaintiffs in this case. And I would submit that this case really comes down to one question. And that question is, is it necessary? Is it really necessary to say that Tom Bates may never again run for the California Assembly? Council, I don't understand why it comes down to that question. I don't understand where we get the power to tell the people of California, you can't have a law unless we think it's necessary. You get it. It, it looks to me as though the law is exactly the opposite under Gregory versus Ashcraft, a Supreme Court decision. It says it is essential to the independence of the states that their power to prescribe the qualifications of their own officers should be exclusive and free from external interference, except so far as plainly provided by the Constitution of the United States. It looks to me as though the question for us is not is it necessary? The question for us is, does the Constitution of the United States impose a limitation that the people of California violated? Now, I slogged all the way through these over limits briefs, and I can't find the provision of the Constitution that's supposed to be violated, and I can't find the U.S. Supreme Court decision that discovers some provision that I couldn't find in the text myself that's supposed to be violated. What is it? What's violated about the Constitution? I have two answers to that, um, Your Honor. Let me get to the specific first in response to the quote that you read from Gregory versus Ashcroft. Subsequently, in Chanda versus Miller, the United States Court, Supreme Court distinguished Gregory and said that states, comma, Gregory reaffirmed, enjoy wide latitude to establish conditions of candidacy for state office. 
But in setting such conditions, they may not disregard basic constitutional protections. And then they go ahead and cite cases based on the First and Fourteenth Amendments, McDaniel versus Patty, uh, which uh, held that uh, you can't put a quality, you can't bar a minister from going to political convention, being part of the state constitutional convention. Congress Par Communist Party of Indiana versus Whitcomb on O's, on O's and uh, Floyd ver Bond versus Floyd. But, but that's not new. That's just rational basis. That's not, no, that's not rational basis. Those are First Amendment cases that were decided under the standards either of Anderson versus Celebrez or of Burdick versus Takushi. But the key case, it seems to me, is the one that predates Gregory, and that's Baker versus Carr. You know, for almost half a century, Californians by initiative had said that we want to structure our government in such a fashion that we're only going to have one representative from each county represented in the state senate. They did it because they had good reasons. They wanted rural interests to feel good about uh, representation. They liked the idea of every county being represented. It was the way they wanted to structure their government. And the United States Supreme Court said no. In Baker versus Carr, it said you can't do that. It violates the first and fourth Council, amendment. Baker versus Carr is about giving one voter a lot more power than another voter because of where he lives. Your case is about giving all voters no power to choose somebody who is termed out, as they put it in California. Now, I can't understand why the state of California is free to say, even during the Vietnam War, you can't elect people under 26 at uh, the draft age cutoff, and why, when marijuana is a major issue in California, the state is free to say you can't vote for people with felony convictions uh, who may have their own particular interests and knowledge and uh, contribution to make on the marijuana for medical use issue, and why, in a state with as many non-citizens as California has, you can't vote for a non-citizen. But it can't say you can't vote for somebody who has been in office for six years, even after it's articulated a rational basis for doing that. Well, I think, you know, first off, with respect to the felony, there's a specific provision of Section 2 that the United States Supreme Court of Article 14, Amendment 14, rather, that the Supreme Court has said takes care of that and allows the state uh, to um, uh, refuse to allow felons to vote or to be qualified for office. Citizenship is obviously something very different. But where this case starts and where the real answer is, is the combination of Baker versus Carr and United States term limits versus Thornton, where the United States Supreme Court has said that term limits are fundamentally undemocratic. That's not what it said. It said that term limits were in many of the states at the time the Constitution was adopted. And the reason that state term limits on federal representatives were unconstitutional is that the states don't have that much power over the federal government. It's to be distinguished from their power over their own government. The court in the United States term limits versus Thornton obviously focused on the federal issue because it was a qualifications issue there. But at page uh, 1862 of 115 Supreme Court, the court said that our conclusion that states lack the power to impose qualifications for Congress vindicates the same fundamental principle of our representative democracy that we recognized in Powell versus McCormick, namely that the people should choose whom they please to, uh, rep to govern them. And then the court went on twice, a quote from Robert Livingston, with great uh, favor saying that the people are the best judges who ought to represent them, to dictate and control them, to tell them whom they shall not elect is to and abridge their natural rights. isn't that precisely what they did? I'm sorry, Your Honor? Isn't that precisely what they did? In, in California. What, well, that's precisely what they were trying to do uh, in the uh, U.S. term limits versus Thornton as well, which is that you had one group of people, a majority, telling a minority group of people that they couldn't vote for the legislator they wanted and the type of legislator they wanted. No, it's because the federal, they were talking about the qualifications for a federal representative for a federal office. This I, is state talking about state qualifications 
or state represent. I, I understand that. Animal. I understand that, Your Honor, that they're that they're very different, and they went off on two separate constitutional provisions. You certainly can't argue, but, can you, that Thornton held that under the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, the term limits are unconstitutional. It never said that. Absolutely not. And I don't argue that. What I do argue is that one cannot come away from reading the majority opinion in Thornton without a recognition that term limits put a severe burden on the right of voters and of candidates. They didn't use the word severe burden because it wasn't a first and fourteenth There's nothing case. in Thornton, is there, that says that uh, the right to serve as a candidate or the uh, right to serve as a legislative uh, representative is a fundamental right? <coughs> No, they certainly didn't, because they weren't addressing that issue. The court was careful not to address that issue. Has any case held that the right to hold office is a fundamental right? Not a fundamental right. There are cases holding that it's a, obviously, that it's a constitutional right. And Anderson versus Celebrez and Burdick in those cases have made it quite clear that when you analyze the fundamental right of voters to vote, that they're really inseparable from the right of candidates to be candidates for office. So it, it really doesn't matter that they haven't said the right to be a candidate is fundamental. What they have said, and the court has repeatedly said, is that the rights of candidates and voters are intertwined, and certainly voters have a fundamental right. But that's not enough to get you to nullify a constitutional amendment to the state of California Constitution, is it? Oh, I think it is. I think if you take the verdict analysis, let's look at it. The verdict analysis is, do we have a severe burden? I would submit to you that the findings of the trial court uh, and the evidence there and U.S. term limits and common sense says that this is a severe burden. Because I can't pick, I can't, John Bates is there, I can't vote for him. Um, a voter cannot vote for the representative of their choice. And that it seems to me, and when she read U.S. term limits versus Thornton and the trial court found, is a real severe burden. If you take that severe burden and then you say, okay, is there a compelling state interest for that? Is there a precisely articulated compelling state interest, which is what Anderson says you have to have? And is it narrowly tailored? And that's either using the verdict test or the more general language of Anderson. Then it seems to me you do come up to a situation in which the state, the interest that the state has articulated, which is to protect us from the power of incumbency, can be achieved by means that are far less restrictive than those uh, in Proposition 140. Well, Is there a compelling state in... Oh, excuse me. Excuse. I'm just going to say, uh, I gather you concede from your brief, in effect, that there is no constitutional prohibition against consecutive term limits. Well, we you certainly were, did not mean to concede that in any way. Well, it's certainly the tenor of the brief as I read it. Uh, your fundamental argument, as I understand it, is that the evil is lifetime term limits. But you don't seem to complain that uh, there are term limits in the office of governor, the office of controller, the office of attorney general, that sort of thing. There, well, let me and there, there is no case, uh, at least so far as I've been able to see, that is expressly held that term limits as such, either on a consecutive basis, are inherently unconstitutional. Well, there's no case that has held that. Our, our position uh, in front of the trial court, and it is here, is that term limits are inherently unconstitutional, that there are less restrictive means of dealing with the interests articulated by the state of California. But we don't focus on that in our briefs because that's not before this court. We have enough trouble without having to deal with consecutive term limits in this case. What we're focusing on is not only a lifetime limit, but one that's a very short duration, the shortest duration in the country. Six years, the California Assembly, and a lifetime ban. That is what is not narrowly tailored. 30 other states don't have term limits at all. Most of the others that do, um, all but six of them, seven rather, don't have even a lifetime ban. And the lifetime bans of others uh, provide for, for many of them longer term limits. Doesn't Burdick say you don't need narrow tailoring? No, Burdick never says that. What Burdick says, Burdick is going back to Anderson. The original Anderson test, um, you know, everybody viewed it as a, as a balancing test where you didn't have to deal with a severe burden. Basically, you had to take... Well, wait a minute. Now, let's, let's get back to what you just said about Burdick. 
You said, no, it doesn't say that. Now I'm reading from Burdick. Petitioner proceeds from the erroneous assumption that a law that imposes any burden on the right to vote must be subject to strict scrutiny. States retain the power to regulate their own elections. To subject every voting regulation to strict scrutiny and to require that the regulation be narrowly tailored to advance a compelling state interest, as petitioner suggests, would tie the hands of the states seeking to assure that elections are operated equitably and efficiently. It looks as though Burdick says exactly the opposite of what you needed to say. No, I don't think so. I think what Burdick is saying, and remember Burdick is, is uh, referring back to the, the, the core of Anderson versus Celebrities. But what Burdick is saying is, look, if there is a trivial, not a very strong impingement on the right to vote, you know, like we had in Burdick, where there was a, you could get on the ballot anyway with 15 writing, that sort of thing, then um, we're not going to engage in strict scrutiny. But it never departed, I think, from... Burdick says it's okay for Hawaii to prohibit write-in voting. That's correct. That's correct. Um, because you can get on... You can get on the ballot with 15 votes, so it's a rather trivial, 15 signatures, I believe it was. It's a rather trivial uh, burden on the right to vote as compared to what we have uh, in a situation like this. Is but Burdick and Anderson all both require that if you don't agree with me, if you don't take, if you don't agree that term limits are a severe burden, you have to agree they're, they're a burden on the right to vote and they're a burden on, on a candidate's right to run for office. And you need to balance that against the precise interest articulated by the state. And all the state has articulated from day one is they want to remove the powers of incumbents. And whether, whether you're just engaging in a, in a balancing test where you're particularly sensitive, uh, when you look at the interests articulated by the state against the burden, you have to say, why in the world? Why do we need a lifetime ban? Why can't Tom Bates come back after one term or well, two? Well, they articulated a little more incumbent? than that. One thing they did articulate that would explain why they shouldn't let people come back after one term is their concern with corruption. It was apparently the theory of uh, the uh, uh, proponents that very long tenure in the legislature increases corruption by giving those with the long tenure more ability to extract what economists call rents from those who want to get things from the state. Another concern that they articulated was that if you had an application only to consecutive terms, that would facilitate swapping, uh, such as George Wallace and Lurleen Wallace did in Alabama. Uh, they articulated reasons. Um, it, it seems to me that you need more than a rational basis test, and you need a narrow tailoring requirement in order to get to first base here. And I can't see what your source for them is. Well, my source, again, is Anderson. Anderson says you have to look at the precisely tailored interests that are precisely articulated, and then you have to weigh that against the interest, excuse me, against the severity of the burden. Is, there a, is there a compelling state interest to vote for a particular candidate? Uh, looking at voters' rights, is there a compelling state interest uh, for voters to vote for a particular candidate? Is there a compelling state interest in allowing a voter to vote for a particular candidate? That's an interesting twist, Your Honor, on the way this is normally presented. Yeah, I, I, I reversed and, it. I'm, yes, I mean, and to, to prevent. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of sorry I hadn't reversed it myself, because I think that there is a compelling <laughs> I see. I didn't mean to provide you with an argument. Yes. What, I'm, <laughs> what, I'm really, what I'm really concerned with is whether uh, the right of voters to vote for a particular candidate is protected uh, in that fashion. Protected in the sense that the state could articulate that as a compelling state interest should it choose to pass a law right. that protects it. Right. I, I think the answer would be clearly yes, that would be a compelling. Uh, let me think about that. That would be that would be an interest in protecting the right to vote. Now the reason I paused is this, because I don't think the state could 
deliberately alter its election processes. I think it raises serious questions when a state deliberately alters its election processes to favor any one class of voters or any one class of candidates. And that, in a sense, is what's happened here because the state has, uh, one of the reasons it's articulated is to injure incumbents and help challenge them. And under Buckley versus Vallejo in the campaign finance cases, there's some real teaching there that the courts really need to take a hard look at laws that prefer one class of voter or one class of candidate over others. But with that caveat, I would agree it's important that people be allowed to vote. It's incredible, incredibly, it's critical in our system. Uh, it's a fundamental part of our system that people ought to be uh, entitled to vote for the candidate of their choice. I was uh, in a colloquy with Judge Scanlon about U.S. term limits versus, uh, versus Thornton, and um, this whole question about whether or not uh, democratic principles apply. And, you know, I would give you uh, what a commentator had to say about U.S. term limits versus Thornton and what that means, and ask you based on that kind of comment from the commentators whether it's really true that you can say it doesn't, that U.S. term limits doesn't say the term limits uh, are a severe burden. Um, the commentator said that the court invoked traditional tools of text, framers' intent, history, and precedent, but it conceded ambiguity in those materials in U.S. term limits. An ambiguity it resolved at every turn with the assertion that term limits are undemocratic. That's a characterization of U.S. term limits, and that's at 64 Chicago Law Review 84. It's a characterization by the attorneys who are here now for the Secretary of State, Mr. Elhay. Oh, you're not quoting from the U.S. term limits decision by the Supreme Court. You're quoting from a law review article about the U.S. term limits case. That's correct. I that's see. a characterization. And that, that I say to you, <clears throat> if the attorney who is here representing the Secretary of State comes away from reading that decision, and says that term limits are, that it says that term limits are fundamentally under in, in U.S. term limits, the Supreme Court had a textual basis. It said, at the time of the convention, states widely supported term limits in at least some circumstances. The Articles of Confederation contained a provision for term limits. Then they looked at the text of Article 10, and they said the states reserve powers not delegated to the federal government. Then they adopted Justice Story's view that the states can't reserve powers they didn't have, and they couldn't have had powers relating to the federal government that didn't exist. Then they looked at the qualifications provision of the Constitution, and they said that text in the U.S. Constitution implies that those are the qualifications, period. End of qualifications. The states can't impose a new one. Uh, you don't have a an analogous textual basis. We don't have the pure analogous textual basis there, but we do have a history of the United States Supreme Court saying that the mere fact that the state wants to structure its government or to use certain uh, election procedures or bars or whatever are not insulated from review by the First and Fourteenth Amendment. And what I think your question raises for me is a very important piece of U.S. term limits that I hadn't referred to. And that is that in U.S. term limits versus Thornton, Justice Stevens canvassed many of the cases that are relied upon by the Secretary of State here. That is, those cases in which the court said, uh, regardless of the test that it applied, that a state could go ahead and erect a barrier, a signature requirement, or some other barrier to getting, on, getting into office. The court distinguished all of those on the grounds that those were procedural bars that term limits are a substantive bar. You know, term limits are immutable. Mr. There is nothing Mr. Bates can do. He could get a million signatures. That won't do him any good. Uh, he could, uh, he could file two another. years early. He could not affiliate with another party. There's nothing he can do. He can run for another office in the legislature. Yeah. Right? But that's not an issue here. The only thing we care about here, the only thing that Larry Burkhalter cares about is voting for Mr. Bates for the assembly, not for, not for some other office. And he can't remove that disability. In U.S. term limits, the court pointed out that those procedural bars are okay for a state, but they're very different from term limits. Term limits are not a procedural bar. Counsel, did, I, did I hear you say a few minutes ago that term limits are fundamentally unconstitutional? Sure. I, if I didn't say it, I sure believe it. Well, um, 
The 22nd Amendment to the Constitution says no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice. So how do you reconcile the, the idea that term limits are fundamentally unconstitutional with the 22nd Amendment that appears to me to be a term limit? The, the same way I reconcile the fact that electing one senator from each county in California is fundamentally unconstitutional. The United States Constitution provides that there will be two senators for every state. Yet it imposes through the First and Fourteenth Amendments on each of those states a requirement that when they do redistricting, they have to comply with one person, one vote. The requirement that there are two senators from each state is sui generis. It's in the federal constitution. The same is true of the 22nd Amendment. It's sui generis. It's not affected by the First and Fourteenth. Can I switch gears one second to something that's troubling me? In you, the legislature, several legislators, and several voters made the identical arguments that are being made uh, in Bates. And the California Supreme Court, the highest court in the state, uh, said that term limits were not unconstitutional under the federal constitution. In effect, the federal court in Bates is being asked to review and disagree, uh, not reverse because we can't, uh, the holding of the California Supreme Court. Uh, this is an unseemly confrontation. Um, and I have some question about whether we even have jurisdiction under the Rooker-Feldman doctrine to entertain this kind of case. Uh, would you help me out? Well, let me say that I, I don't think it's an unseemly uh, confrontation. And in fact, uh, if this court strikes down California's term limits uh, and the United States Supreme Court doesn't grant review of that, uh, I think notwithstanding everything the Secretary of State has said about potential conflicts, that the matter will be at an end. And that's for a couple well, of reasons. Why, why, why would it be? Why couldn't Mr. Bates go into the Secretary of State uh, or anyone else who was in the legislature, uh, has ever served in the legislature, and say, I'd like to retire in the office that is most important to me, so I want to run again. The Secretary of State, I assume, would say, well, no, you can't, because the California Supreme Court has said term limits are the law of the state of California. And I assume that person would then pull out the federal order and say, well, but, but I've got a federal court order to the contrary. Then what happens? Well, I, I think two things. One is I'd, I'd inquire the Secretary of State about that, because this court would have affirmed a declaratory judgment that term limits are unconstitutional. California's term limits are unconstitutional. Now, when the California Supreme Court decided the original case, um, it pointed out that there was not guidance from the United States Supreme Court on exactly how to apply the standards. That is, we didn't have the verdict decision yet. And more importantly, we didn't have US term limits versus Thornton yet, both of whom this court, I don't think this court can assume that the California Supreme Court would not have paid attention to those decisions then or wouldn't have paid attention to them now if they came to it. So when the Secretary of State has a declaration by this court that they're unconstitutional, I think he's bound by that. I don't think he can say, I'm not going to follow it even though I was a party to this, sort, to this and I've got an order in my hand saying I have to follow it. What I think you're suggesting is, well, maybe someone else comes over, as the Secretary of State suggested, and files a lawsuit and says, gee, based on on what happened back in you before all of this law developed, we think there's a conflict. I say, again, we have a lot of trouble with this particular case. That's one that's out there we really don't need to reach. I don't think it's gonna to come to pass. I really don't. Let me ask a question that I, to clarify a point I was earlier trying to make. There may well be a, uh, a constitutional right on the part of voters uh, to vote for, for uh, all types of classes of people, and if a, a class of persons is restricted, that that might well require a compelling state interest to deprive the voters of, the, of that. Is that also true with regard to the voters 
voting for one particular candidate? Well, you know, uh, I, I don't want to beat this horse too much to death, but I know that Mr. Elhag took from U.S. term limits and put in his article the notion that that appeared to be what the Supreme Court felt, that there was an unfettered right to choose the candidate of your choice. But my own view is the same. My own view is that this is a constitutional democracy, that it is founded on the notion that people should choose their own representatives. We have term limits every two years for the California Assembly. People could throw Tom Bates out any time they want. Those people who believe in inexperience, people who think that uh, you know, knowledge isn't, isn't of, of any great value or experience doesn't teach, those people who believe in inexperience are always free to vote for somebody who's not experienced. But under California's term limits, if I really believe that there's some value to experience, that it teaches, um, that there's some real value to having a representative who knows what he or she is doing, I can't vote for that. Person. And what is happening with the term limits law is that it is stacking the deck. It is saying people who believe in what I believe in are allowed to go ahead and are not allowed to vote, while people who believe in precisely the opposite can elect candidates who share their values and, and act on it. Council, well, then, excuse me, just want to, then to follow, follow your uh, argument along then, you would say that, that there is, uh, then it would require a compelling state interest uh, to deprive the voters of that right and that it's not narrowly tailored enough, is that? That's absolutely right, and I'd refer the court to uh, your own decision, which uh, I apologize for not having found earlier, but it's Matsumoto versus uh, PUA, PUA, I think, at 775 Fed Second 1393. Well, now, I read Matsumoto, and it seems to me that the problem with Matsumoto is that it's a total ban on all offices, all offices. It's, 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 it's not such as voters of California have adopted a restriction on the amount of time in a specific office with no restriction on running for other offices. How can you say it's analogous? Well, I think it's quite analogous. It was a recall. It was a law that said after a recall, you couldn't serve for two years in any office after you had been recalled. The emphasis on the any office. That's right. Now, the court's emphasis was very much on the fact that it was that council race. For example, it pointed out because of the election term, it would take five years before you could get back. But it is true that that's any office. But it's also true that strict scrutiny was applied, and that was a consecutive term. That wasn't even a lifetime ban. That's far less intrusive. It's pretty intrusive. I think it's outrageous to say you can't run. But it's not for life. It's only for two years. Counsel, I, it seems to me that your case is much easier for the state of California than the load that the state of Missouri had to carry in Gregory versus Ashcroft. In Gregory, the state said, you can't vote for anyone as a judge if they're over 70. Now, I serve with a lot of judges who are over 70, and they're very fine judges, and it would be a terrible loss not to have them. But Missouri wouldn't let a citizen vote for a judge over 70. The United States Supreme Court said that the authority of the people of the states to determine the qualifications of their most important government officials is at the heart of representative government is reserved to the states under the 10th Amendment and is guaranteed to them by the provision by the uh, provision of the Constitution under which the United States guarantees every state a Republican form of government. They found a textual basis for saying, even though it seems like a really bad idea not to let people vote for judges over 70, nevertheless, the states and the people in the states have the constitutional power to do that. And then they said, we will not overturn such a law. That's laws such as the one that says you can't vote for a judge over 70 unless the varying treatment of different groups or persons is so unrelated to the achievement of any combination of legitimate purposes that we can only conclude that the people's actions were irrational. Now that takes you back to Judge Hugg's, Chief Judge Hugg's inquiry. Unless you identify some group that is prejudiced uh, in an irrational way, I, you, you can't possibly say that the interest the citizens have in putting an experienced state legislature, le, le, state legislator back in office is even greater 
than the interests of the citizens in putting an experienced judge over 70 back in office. You have to be able to satisfy this very liberal test. But, I, you know, you can. First off, that case was not a Voting Rights Act case. It was an age discrimination case. So the very hard both. issues, that, well, it was. They had two separate had sections right of the opinion. But they didn't really deal with the hard First and 14th Amendment issues that we're dealing with here. It was basically an age discrimination. Yes, they did. Section three. Plaintiffs argue that even if they're not covered by the ADEA, the Missouri Constitution's mandatory retirement provision violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and there's no rational basis. Yes, but there's no real discussion of these issues the way Pages 2406 the case. through 2408. But if you turn to, again, to Chandler versus Miller, um, the court took Gregory versus Ashcraft, looked at it in the context of a real restriction on the right, in fact, a far less one than here, on the right to be a legislator, that is, you have to pass a drug test, and distinguish Gregory. Said so that's, you know, you can say all you want about it, but when everything is said and done, and it's true here, we have to go back to the first and 14th amendments, and we have to ask this question. We have to ask whether we really need a lifetime ban after six years of service in the California legislature. And I think the answer to that is no, and I would say as a final point that there's talk about increasing Hispanics and minority uh, and, and women in the California legislature. The trial judge found that's a transient phenomenon. It's going to happen anyway. And there are two of them, Martha Escudia, who's being thrown out next year unless something is done about it, and Barbara Friedman will be thrown out, thrown out after five and a half years service. So this is not a, uh, an initiative that promotes representative, more representative government. It's one that goes far, far further than is necessary to accomplish its purposes. All right, thank you, Council. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Judge Hawkins, you asked about what would distinguish a law that barred lawyers from running for office. And there's a number of distinctions. Uh, one of the crucial reasons for term limits is that senior legislators have an advantage over all other candidates. And it is unique to them. In every one district, uh, there's one senior legislator. That creates the possibility of an ideological gap, that the voters will feel compelled because of the senior legislator's greater power in the legislature to vote for them, even though they don't represent their views. Do you have any uh, empirical well. data on that? Uh, yes, which we do have uh, some uh, I mean, empirical. The voters of Spokane uh, voted Tom Foley out. He was Speaker of the House. It is Many true. Many other examples. Uh, well, of course, the voters voted Tom Foley out in part because he supported litigation against term limits. Uh, and they were <laughs> retribution uh, against that decision uh, that led to Well, I, I threw you a good soft pitch, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, but there, so there is some empirical data. Uh, he was that, against term limits for uh, federal officials. That was the issue, right? Yes, and he supported uh, a lawsuit uh, against it. But also, I think it is true that every, in every incumbent can be Actually, voted out. Actually, he was right, was wasn't he? <laughs> uh, According to the Supreme Court. Uh, yes, he was successful in the litigation. Uh, but the, uh, it is true, I think, that the incumbent can stray sufficiently far. The electorate won't reelect anybody who's in office. But they may feel that the greater power over that that senior legislator has over the issues they have in common with the electorate outweigh the fact that they deviate on other issues. With lawyers, uh, it's not like that. Any advantage a lawyer has over a non-lawyer uh, does not create the same ideological gap uh, because there's lots of lawyers of every political persuasion and, uh, and view, and so uh, we don't have uh, uh, that kind of effect. It's also the case that empirically, <coughs> we had a legislature dominated by senior legislators and incumbents before term limits. We did not have a legislature dominated by uh, freshman newcomer lawyers uh, who had advantages over everybody else. Incumbents had a 10 to 16 percent vote advantage simply by virtue of their incumbency and were re-elected at a rate of 100 percent in the Senate, 97 percent 
uh, in, uh, in the assembly. I read somewhere that prior to 1992, there was a lower turnover among members of the United States Congress seeking re-election incumbents than there was in the British House of Lords. Yet that's changed, and it changed because people got tired of the folks that were in there. Well, uh, that did change, but actually, the, of the candidates who actually ran for re-election, 90% of them got re-elected. Many voluntarily chose to leave. And over that period, one of the reasons many of them, there's two reasons many of them chose to leave. Uh, one was that actually, if you retire during a certain window, you got to keep your campaign funds uh, and take them personally. That led to an increased retirement. Let me ask you another question that's on, on my mind. Did you, uh, do you take the position that the lifetime ban is unambiguous? Yes. Is that what your side argued before the California Supreme Court? Uh, the Attorney General, on behalf of the prior Secretary of State, argued that it was textually ambiguous for purposes, again, of this special doctrine that has furthers narrow construction, favors narrow constructions of statutes to sustain their constitutional validity. But of course, we are bound, the Secretary is bound as this court is bound by the California Supreme Court's rejection of that proposition. They found that the ballot materials resolved any ambiguity there might have been in the measure. Mr. L. Hay, before you, it sounds like you're going back into the notice area now. But while you're still in the constitutional area of the argument, uh, as I understand it, uh, I have a federal uh, constitutional right in a state election to vote for the candidate of my choice. Is that true? No, that's not true. There's no. There is, the court, in fact, has rejected the proposition that there's a federal constitutional right to vote for a particular candidate. Uh, and this relates uh, to the question. Well, uh, let Hunter. me take it a little farther. The candidate of my choice, but the state has the power to determine the qualifications of candidates. Now, is that correct? Oh, you have a right to vote for a qualified candidate. Qualified candidate. Yes. That's correct. So I've got a federally protected constitutional right to vote for the candidate of my choice, provided that that candidate meets the qualifications prescribed by the state. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. Unless there might be other, there are other ballot access restrictions that are constitutional right. that might not be now, But the state then can set the qualifications. Yes. Uh, if the state had the unfettered right to set any qualifications it could, I suppose we wouldn't be here. And therefore, there must be some restrictions on the qualifications that a state may set. And if that's so, then isn't the question whether California has established reasonable standards under a rational basis test, or whether we have to get into whether the standards are the most narrowly tailored under the strict scrutiny test. Is that right? Well, that's right uh, with this overlay, that in deciding that question, uh, the court should accord the state deference in the sense of not concluding that strict scrutiny applies unless that's plainly compelled. Well, then, that's is the fundamental issue in this case whether we apply rational basis or strict scrutiny analysis? Uh, yes, I think under rational basis analysis, there's no doubt uh, that the term limits survive. But if we apply strict scrutiny, can you win? Yes, I think, I think we still win under strict scrutiny. Well, uh, even if it's under strict scrutiny, uh, lifetime term limits, I think, are the least restrictive means of accomplishing the goals that they have. One goal uh, is to reduce differences in le legislative power that different districts have. Uh, my opponent mentions Baker versus Carr. I think Baker versus Carr strongly supports us, because one of the things it held was that legislative districts for any one population, they should have equal power. Some districts have far more seniority than other districts, uh, the power is greatly unequal. So it furthers that norm, and consecutive term limits would, because consecutive lim term limits simply require you to step out uh, for a hiatus, and then come back into office. So you could still have uh, big differences in legislative power. The second important compelling interest is to prevent voter choice from being coerced uh, by the prospect of losing the seniority clout that they have. 
state voters uh, might vote for a senior legislator because they don't want to lose their relative power in the legislature. Well, consecutive term limits don't eliminate that problem either because if you take some of these high, highly senior legislatures, mm. simply say you can leave for two years and come back, they're still going to have that seniority advantage. But what do you do about the power that's in the hands of the staff? I mean, are they out after six years, or eight years? Well, staff I mean, the, uh, the actually... The bureaucracy that's mm -hmm. there, that's where the p real power lies, does it not? Well, uh, some argue uh, the opposite, I guess, that, uh, that the trouble with long-term legislators is that they tend to get captured by the staff. And that's a choice that the voters could have made. Uh, in fact, the voters, when they passed Proposition 140, at the same time cut staff, uh, attempting to address that concern uh, that you yeah, that uh, was raised. There. And uh, on average, staff actually serve shorter periods of time than six years. That's because they become lobbyists. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Council. Thank you. <clears throat> the, uh, very helpful or oral arguments. We appreciate it. Uh, court will be adjourned. Judicial programming continues this weekend on America and the Courts. This week's edition features a tribute to former Supreme Court Justices Louis Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter. Speakers include Justice Stephen Breyer, Senator...